Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you're watching these videos, these videos are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my Human Anatomy and Physiology courses at Del Mar College. If anyone else finds them helpful, great. But know that the curriculum and the delivery is designed for those students preparing for my exams in my class. As you guys know, we're in the coronavirus shutdown, so I'm doing videos online for my students to get instructional delivery. Um, this particular video is for my Human Anatomy and Physiology 2 students. We've been doing all the senses, sensory physiology. Hopefully you've watched all the general sensory, uh, general sensory videos. You've watched the special senses of uh, olfaction, gustation, and you've watched this series of visual physiology. This video is going to start uh, the sensory physiology of equilibrium and hearing, which are done by the inner ear. So I'm going to do some setup, and then we're going to go into the notes. We'll be following along on page 18 of my note set if you're one of my students. So now, if you look at the inner ear model from lab, you know that there's one part of the inner ear that coils around on itself, and these coils end up bulging out into a large area. This area is going to have three big loops. One of them is going to come kind of forward, and where they join this area here, there's a swelling. There's another loop that's going to lie on its side, and it's going to have an enlarged area here. And they're going to join together in this st structure. There would be a third loop running this way, and I haven't drawn it all the way around. It's a little bit hard to draw it and keep it visually appealing. This structure here is called the cochlea. This area in the middle is called the vestibule. And then these three structures are referred to as the semicircular canals because they're like half a circle and they're canals. I usually abbreviate these as SCC just for simplicity as my shorthand. Now before I go too far into this one of the things I want you guys to know and by the way each semicircular canal gets a name. The one that is coming front to back would be our anterior semicircular canal. The one that's lying on its side is called the lateral semicircular canal. And the one that you can see through if you're looking at the model this way would be called the posterior semicircular canal. We're going to talk about those. Now, the inner ear really is sort of this maze of bone called the bony labyrinth. You'll see this term labyrinth, which means a maze. Like if you get lost in a maze of things. Now, there's a bony labyrinth and a membranous labyrinth. We've covered a little bit of this, a bit of this in lab, but I want to get this concept across to you before I go into detail here. So imagine, all y'all know what PVC pipe is, the clear, um, not the clear, the white plastic piping that makes up plumbing. So if I took a tube of PVC pipe and I capped the end of it off, I could actually fill the pipe with some fluid, maybe some pink Kool-Aid or something, some Hawaiian punch or something. Now, what if I took a long blue, light blue um, water balloon filled with water and I suspended it in here? so that it's floating in the fluid. So I have a hard plastic covering and I have a soft flexible balloon in here. The fluid that is outside the balloon that is filling the space between the balloon and the um, PVC piping would go all the way around the balloon this way and around the backside filling all of it. So it's completely surrounded and suspended and floating in a tube of fluid. And then there would be some fluid inside the balloon. Well, that's how the inner ear is set up. Now imagine if I took this PVC pipe and I coiled it around on itself like this, everywhere the PVC pipe goes, the balloon goes and follows it. And the fluid inside the balloon would stay inside the balloon even though it's curved around. And the fluid outside the balloon would still be surrounding it. Only now we can start to twist it around and knot it up. Well, the PVC piping represents the bony labyrinth, the, the thin shell of bone that makes the shape of the inner ear. If I could slice the inner ear open, there would be a tube-like membranous structure going all around inside of here where it reaches these enlargements. Each one of these enlargements is called an ampulla. So everywhere where one of the semicircular canals joins the vestibule, it's called an ampulla. Well, wherever the bone goes, if it, if it bulges out, so does the uh, membranous labyrinth. And so I would have 
the, the membranous labyrinth and the bony labyrinth following each other like this. Now, where these areas are here, they're actually going to join or spread out here. They'll form two bumps. And then the membranous labyrinth would also continue inside the cochlea all the way around. So now I have two mazes. I have a bony labyrinth on the outside, and I have a membranous labyrinth following it everywhere. The fluid that goes around the membranous labyrinth, or between the bony and membranous labyrinth, is a fluid called perilymph. The fluid inside the membranous labyrinth would be a fluid called endolymph. Now, lymph is, is a term for a clear, um, it's a colorless fluid that is filtered out of our blood. And as I stated in previous videos, all of our cells have a range of homeostatic conditions under which they operate. Some cells have a very broad range of oxygen and glucose and calcium and sodium and um, you know, nutrient concentrations. Some cells have a very narrow range of homeostatic conditions. They have to have everything perfect. The biggest wimps and weenies in the human body are neurons. Because neurons can't handle some of the other stuff in our blood, we have to specially filter our blood to feed the neurons. They put their waste in it, and then we reabsorb it. In our, most of our nervous system, we call it cerebrospinal fluid, and it's filtered out of blood vessels called the choroid plexus. In the eyeball, we call it aqueous humor. In the inner ear, we call it endolymph and perilymph. Okay? So now... Inside the membranous labyrinth is endolymph. Outside of it, everywhere it goes, would be perilymph. Those fluids are really important because they're going to trigger the senses of equilibrium and hearing. And so a lot of this is explained at the top of page 18 as far as the anatomy. So now I'm going to erase some of this over here because I want to be able to write some more detail and draw out what's going to happen so that we can understand equilibrium and we can understand the process of hearing. Now... One of the things we do know is that the cochlea itself is going to monitor what we call audition or hearing. Inside the cochlea are cells that have little cilia that we call hair cells, but they're really cilia, not hairs. That when we trigger the movement of those hair cells, they're going to signal hearing. And the nerve coming out of the cochlea on our models on the back of the cochlea would be called the cochlear nerve. And all the axons from all the hair cells in the cochlea are going to exit there. And if you look at the model, we had some little lines coming out of the ampullae, the utricle, and saccule that are going to form a large nerve called the vestibular nerve. I'm just going to abbreviate it, but that would be our vestibular nerve going to what we call the vestibular complex. The vestibular complex includes the vestibule and the three semicircular canals. This, the vestibule and the semicircular canals are, or the vestibular complex are going to monitor equilibrium, our sense of balance. Okay, so now these two nerves are going to fuse together eventually and they're going to f f form what we call cranial nerve number eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. Okay, sorry, I didn't do that very well. So, our vestibulocochlear nerve, or cranial nerve number eight, is a fusion of the vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve. Because the cochlea does hearing, if I damage the cochlear nerve, I lose my, some of my sense of hearing. If I damage the vestibular nerve, or any of its branches, I might lose some of my equilibrium. There are some diseases which cause a sense of loss of equilibrium um, that damage the vestibular nerve or some of these structures in here, okay? Um, anyway, so now, in your note set, it talks about all of this, and it talks about the semicircular canals. I want to focus on them first, and then we'll do the utricle and saccule. So of the vestibular complex, the three semicircular canals themselves monitor what we call rotational motion. And this is the blink in your note set. If you're following along on page 18, the three semicircular canals can detect rotational motions. So those movements, if we're spinning in one of three axes, front to back, side to side, or actually what we call horizontal rotation, and then lateral or side to side rotation. So 
This is how it works. If I were to cut this little area out here and magnify it, then the membranous labyrinth comes down and it will bulge out into a structure inside the ampulla. There's a group of neurons, some cells that sit in here in a little bump like this, and right on the edge here are some neurons. They're gonna have some little cilia or hairs sticking out. It turns out that some of the fluid in the inner ear will gelatinize, kind of like the vitreous body in the eyeball. And that will sit on here like this. We call this the cupula. And the cupula is sort of a gelatinous mass, almost like jello. So imagine if I had jello sitting in the bottom of a glass of water. If I start to wiggle the water enough, the jello will start to wiggle with it since it's semi solid. If I start to wiggle this cupula, then I will start to bend the hair cells that are suspended in it. If I bend them one way, it'll tell me that I'm rotating in one direction. If I bend them the opposite direction, it'll tell me I'm rotating in another direction. So each of the three semicircular canals have a cupula inside the ampulla. And this little bulb of hair cells here is called the crista. Crista means comb, like you comb your hair, and that's what it looks like with the little hair sticking out. It's called the crista ampullaris. So each of the ampullae of the semicircular canals have a crista ampullaris and a cupula. If you start to rotate, if you rotate one direction, as the fluid moves this way, it might pull the cupula with it. And if the fluid starts moving in the opposite direction, it'll push the cupula, which tells you which direction you're rotating. Okay? You need to know that anatomy. Now, one of the things I want you to know is this. Now that we see that anatomy, I'm going to erase some of this so that I can continue to write over here. When it comes to the three semicircular canals, I want you to know which one monitors which rotational motion. The anterior semicircular canal does what we call anterior and posterior rotation. Because of the way that it's positioned in our heads, if I lean my head forward or backwards, those hairs get bent in opposite directions. So if you were sitting in a tire rolling head over heels, in one direction or the other, you would be signaling the anterior um, ampulla, and you would be signaling the hair cells there, sending a signal out the vestibular nerve to your brain that you're doing this. You're head banging at a Metallica concert or something. The lateral semicircular canal does what we call horizontal rotation. This is gonna confuse some people, but pay attention. You would be rotating with the horizon this way, like you're spinning, like a, an ice skater or a ballerina sitting there spinning. And finally, the posterior semicircular canal is going to do what we call lateral rotation. And that's what confuses people. But lateral rotation would mean from right side to left side. So if you were kind of rocking back and forth, or if you were doing cartwheels, that would be the posterior semicircular canal. Okay, so know that information. Now, when it comes to the utricle and saccule within the vestibule, the utricle and saccule are going to monitor what we call or detect what we call angular rotation. In mathematics and geometry, if we travel in a particular line, we call that the angle. Or we think of it as linear, like in a straight line. But they monitor, the utricle and saccule monitor what we call angular motions and or linear motions, and they monitor gravitational motion. So if you're looking in the note set, this would be your first blank. They monitor angular or linear movement as well as gravitational motion, straight up and down or straight forward, straight back. Now, when it comes to the structures inside the, the utricle and saccule, there's a little structure in there called the macula. And what we have is, sitting in here, we have a little group of these neurons, like this, with little cilia on them. Those cilia, or hairs, and then these cells are gonna send axons out like this. These are neurons, okay? This would have been dendrites, but they're modified. These are the axons. 
sitting on top of these cells in the macula, there is another mass of gelatin. Sitting on top of that mass of gelatin are going to be some little crystal-like stones. The term lith means stone, like lithography means writing in stone, and so they call these otoliths. Odo means ear, like an otoscope for looking in the ear. So the otoliths are these little stones that are sitting, or little crystals that are sitting on this gelatinous mass. And together they're called otoconia and the staticonia. And you can look at some of that anatomy in the book. But these little crystals or stones, the otoconia or otoliths, are sitting on this gelatinous mass, and the hairs of the cells of the macula are sitting in there. If we move in a straight line, then those little otoliths can lag behind. If I got shot forward, if my fingers represent the hair cells, and this represents one of those crystals, if I move really rapidly in one direction, or let me pick this up, I'm sorry, if I move really rapidly in the opposite direction, it will lag behind and pull those hairs or those cilia. If I pull them one way, it'll tell me that I'm moving in an anterior direction. If I pull them in the other way, it tells me I'm moving in a posterior direction. And the utricle and saccule are set up differently so that when I bend them, it tells me if I'm moving up, like if you got in an elevator or you got shot straight up in a ride on like on a... Um, like one of the rides at a big theme park, or if you got dropped, you would feel yourself falling. That gravitational motion up and down and straight forward and straight back is handled by the utricle and saccule. So all of this stuff is in the notes. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna read this to you so that you can understand. So it says, they monitor angular or gravitational motions. The utricle and saccule are clustered into small structures called maculae, plural, and macula would be singular. The cells are sitting in a gelatinous mass, and on top of that are a bunch of little structures called otoliths. They make a mass called the otoconia or staticonia, and it's those movements. So when you read those words in the note set, hopefully these pictures help you understand that. Now, I'm not going to make you learn which direction they go, acceleration, deceleration. You can look that up if you like, okay? So that is all the information I want you to know about equilibrium. Um, I do want you to understand that the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, it's going to monitor um, our sense of equilibrium. And if any of these structures get damaged, we can get a sense of sort of a dizziness. Um, so, um, or, you know, the, another term for that feeling of lack of, uh, of, of equilibrium is called vertigo. That's the technical term for the dizziness or sort of that being off balance or lack of equilibrium. Also, sometimes if people get punched or hit their head or just move too rapidly, the fluids inside of here can displace some of those otoliths and then you can feel sort of a constant vertigo. There's a move that was uh, figured out by some physical therapists that if you do this real weird body positioning to move really fast, sometimes you can rebalance them. So some people get vertigo for that reason. Also, when you get inner ear infections, you feel a little dizzy or off kilter. Or if you have a sinus infection, because the ear, nose, and throat are all connected, we sometimes will hypersecrete these fluids, putting pressure on these structures, and you just feel a little woozy or lightheaded. You have a slight case of vertigo when you're not feeling well, when you're very stuffy. All right? Listen, I'm going to do one more video, which is going to cover hearing. So we'll be done with sensory physiology. I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. All right. See you guys on the flip side in the next video.